All right, I think it's I think we're reaching critical mass, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the next generation of food packaging. So my name is Brian. I'm the global director of the food program, and I'll give some brief opening remarks on our company. Then I'll pass it off to Anne Julie, who will lead this event. So um, I'll start with a little history. So our company, if you're not familiar, uh, we started, I guess our, our company started uh, in the early 90s uh, with a small building in Palo Alto on University Avenue, right downtown. Uh, here we had a, a building we called the Lucky Building where we rented out real estate to some early stage technology companies of the time. And uh, these companies ended up being very successful and we ended up investing in them. And uh, you pass to our, our current time and we have a much larger program uh, we have roughly 30 offices globally, uh, roughly a thousand employees and making 250 investments a year. So it's been really fun to see this growth. And um, Chicago is one of our next locations where we'll be spending a lot of time and, and building out an office. So we're really excited to start uh, running a series of events here. And this will be one of the first webinars we host um, for this office. So our food and beverage program runs across uh, six different offices today. Uh, we started back in 2017 with our, our main office in Silicon Valley. Here we run an accelerator program that happens twice per year, uh, lasting for three months each. And uh, in these accelerator programs, uh, we uh, have a selection day where we choose the startups that join. Uh, we have a variety of events throughout the program where, where startups can collaborate with our mentors and other corporations that are involved in the platform. And then we end the program with a uh, expo where they showcase their progress uh, and their technology. To all of our network. Um, so this is kind of how our accelerator programs run. We also do a variety of investments. Uh, the company overall makes about 250 investments a year. So we're very active in the early stage uh, space for, for technology investments. Um, so Silicon Valley was where we started. Uh, last year we opened up our first two offices outside of our, of our home turf. Uh, one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, one in Milan, Italy, which, all, which now are, are very uh, uh, stable programs running their own accelerators and making their own investments. Uh, this year was very active as well for us. Uh, we launched a program in Fargo, North Dakota, focused on agriculture. And we also launched a program uh, out in Thailand. Um, so actually that, that 2021 should be 2020. Um, and then Chicago uh, was the newest one and we'll start our program next year. So really excited to get, get this going and building on a network here. And we hope this, uh, this event's a good, a good way to kind of introduce to some, some of you who are new uh, who we are and what we do. So overall, the program focus, the technology focus of our program is really based off our corporate partners. We have a set of maybe, uh, I guess, 26 large corporations that sit on, on the board of our food and beverage program globally. So these are the companies that dictate to us what types of startups that we will work with and what types of themes we'll cover on our events. So ingredient innovation has historically been the biggest focus of our program. However, with our move to Chicago, we have several new partners and we're working with several new teams uh, within the corporate network that we serve that has a big focus on food packaging. So we're gonna see that become a bigger element of our program. And this event is, uh, is meant to showcase some of that. So uh, our move to Chicago is uh, rather recent. Um, I think there's one more slide on this, if you can go to the next one. Um, so I think the, uh, the main reason why we entered Chicago is because of our partners. There's a variety of large companies that we work with that are um, really, that are based in Chicago, that have a huge team out there and have asked us to join uh, Chicago. A lot of our events are happening in Silicon Valley, so it is a little bit of a plane ride to get over there. So we hope this is much more convenient and can get really the, the right people working with us and joining these types of events when, when they go back to in-person, of course. So uh, we really think it's gonna be a big hit and uh, it's gonna get more people involved in working with our startups, which is our number one focus. Um, so we'll be hosting a variety of events out in, in the area and we'll be, we'll be posting a calendar of activities. So if any of you guys are interested in, in meeting our startups, joining other activities, uh, we'd, we'd, love to, uh, we'd love to have you. Um, so we think Chicago is gonna be a great hit, mostly because really a lot of our partners are there and just getting uh, increased engagement is the most important part for us. Okay, um, so with that said, that's a, just a little brief introduction on plug and play. Uh, my colleague, Ann Julie, will take the lead from here. Uh, she helped uh, coordinate a lot of what you're gonna see today. So thanks for all the hard work, Ann Julie, and good luck. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us for this event. 
Uh, my name is Anne Julie. I'm the, an internal business development analyst at Plug and Play, and I'm going to be moderating the session today. So uh, we're going to talk about the future of food packaging. As we keep hearing in the media, the current situation of packaging is quite terrifying. So the equivalent of 65 trash trucks per day of plastic waste are dumped into the ocean in the United States. The United States ranks 20th on the list of countries contributing to plastic pollution in the ocean. But finding new solution is quite challenging because there is a lack of common standards. Legislations keep evolving in the US, but also in other countries. The performance of the recycling system in the US is also pretty low. And in addition to that, people also care more and more about food safety with the impact of COVID-19. So how can we make sure that our packaging helps with both food, helps with both food safety and sustainability? So we're going to try to be a bit, bit more optimistic about the future of packaging today. And we're going to discuss potential, potential solutions with our four panelists who are key players in packaging innovation. So the main focus is to rethink the packaging system and we'll see how we can move towards a more circular economy. So let's start with uh, the agenda for today. So we're going to have 50 minutes of discussion and then 30 minutes of Q&A. And please start sharing your questions right now with us in the chat box. And we're going to answer everything at the end of the discussion. So now I'm going to introduce our four panelists. So we're going to start with Jamie Glyden, who is the head of packaging at Ocean Spray. So Jamie, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Glyden, and I'm the lead packaging engineer at uh, Ocean Spray Cranberries. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in the CPG packaging world. Ocean Spray was founded in 1930 by three cranberry farmers on the principle that we're stronger when we are working together. And now today our cooperative now includes over 700 small family farms across Massachusetts, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Oregon, Washington, Quebec, British Columbia, and Chile. And Ocean Spray is committed to connecting farms to families for a better life and driving forward a sustainable, nutritious food system that improves the health of people and planet. Thank you, and I look forward to today's, today's, to today's discussion. Thank you, Jamie. So now uh, we're going to learn more about John Brooks, staff engineer packaging R&D at the Hershey Company. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is, as she said, is John Brooks um, from the Hershey Company. Um, Hershey is a confection snacks company uh, that was is based in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We were founded by Milton Hershey in 1894. Um, he started his company with a small caramel uh, business in Philadelphia, where it has evolved into the candy company that we know today. Um, I've had 12 years of experience in the CPG world, um, specifically um, in R&D. And at Hershey, I work in our research and development group um, and part of the packaging innovation team where I'm leading our sustainable packaging initiatives. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today and the panel Thank you, John. So our third panelist is Tony Rossi, EVP of Business Development at TerraCycle. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is, is Tony from, from TerraCycle. TerraCycle is a, uh, a mission-driven company, and our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste. We've been doing that from our headquarters in Trenton, New Jersey for almost 20 years now. Uh, we operate in over 22 countries around the world, and we have two primary pillars to our business. The first, and what I'm sure most people may know us for, is our recycling business. But in 2019, we, we launched Loop, which is uh, an arm of, of TerraCycle that focuses on reuse. And last year, we also launched our nonprofit foundation in Thailand, uh, focused on cleaning up rivers and waterways in, in that country. Uh, we work with some of the, the largest CPG companies in the world, both in the personal care, beauty, home care, and, and obviously food and beverage space, and look forward to our discussion today. Thank you, 
Thank you, Tony. Uh, and our last panelist is Dr. Melton Demirtas, Principal Environmental Engineer and Group Leader for Bioprocessing and Separations at Argon National Laboratory. Good morning. This is Melton Morgan Demirtas. Uh, I have been working at Argon National Laboratory as a Principal Environmental Engineer and Group Leader in Applied Materials Division. Argan National Laboratory is one of Department of Energy's national laboratory. Department of Energy has 17 national laboratory for development of new technologies that can apply it in energy, water, medicine, as well as manufacturing uh, areas. Um, we have been operated by University of Chicago on behalf of uh, Department of Energy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Um, so now we're going to, to start the discussion. And the first thing that we're going to try to understand is where the dem demand is coming from, like how customers' demand is driving change. So we've seen that customers' demand for waste-free packaging has been evolving over the past five years. And why? what have you seen as key drivers? So maybe, Jamie, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think just consumers are much more aware of not only the products they're buying, but the packages they come in. So whether that means whether they're recyclable or um, there's other type of materials there or whether the package is oversized or sized appropriately, I just think consumers are much more aware of these days, which I think now takes place into their purchase decision. John, is there anything that you want to, to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll add there that, you know, the materials we use are very conscious of um, and designed to have that sustainable and or recyclable um, the fit coming in from an innovation side, making sure that up front it's being designed to have that sustainable um, backing behind it, just so that it gives our consumers uh, the opportunity to make that decision. Um, mm -hmm. And if they aren't making that decision, we're making it for them so that um, moving forward that those decisions for the recyclable packages is, is kind of moving forward in that direction. Great. And clearly we expect it to be in a different world uh, post COVID-19, which all of us are trying to predict. So what do you think as experts in this field, post pandemic packaging requirements, expectations will be from materials e-commerce supply chain and consumers perspective. How did, yeah, how did COVID-19 impact pack packaging requirements and? Yep. Yeah, I think, I think oh, sorry, John. I was just gonna say, uh, we've definitely have become more aware of um, less touching um, when it comes to some of our products that are our hand to mouth category. Um, just being very aware that um, like portioning out our products and uh, having less uh, of that uh, I don't, I hate to say it, but the less of the sharing, uh, tactile, um, of comments or excuse me, of, uh, interaction. Um, so hopefully once, uh, post COVID those, those types of sharing moments, will be able to, uh, reincorporate back into, uh, those sharing, uh, experiences with our uh, consumers. Right. I, I think, you know, COVID has not just created you know, a new normal for today, but it will carry into the future. And I, I echo what John said. I think when you're talking about multi-serve, I think that's an area that's going to uh, change a bit to make sure you can do sanitary sharing is what mm -hmm. I would call it. And um, I think also there's going to be a very strong place for value uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. And another thing, I think just e-com will continue to grow as will, you know, maybe grocery delivery. So if people are not, you know, willing to go out to the store as much or being cautious in that area, I think those areas will continue to grow, especially post COVID. Great, thank you so much for your insight. Um, so now that we have a better understanding of why packaging needs to evolve, it would be great to take a look at the potential solutions. So um, how are you rethinking food packaging in a way that is more sustainable? And do you have any example of technologies that you've seen to reduce waste. I'll let you go sure. first, Jamie. <laughs> sure, I'll go. Um, you know, Ocean Spray is happy to announce we're partnering with uh, 
companies like uh, Loop and TerraCycle. Um, Loop is looking at um, designing reusable packaging that gets uh, sanitary cleaned and then gets returned to the manufacturer and then goes back out to the consumer. Um, so that's going to obviously reduce the amount of packaging out in the um, in the field, I would say. And then also TerraCycle is a uh, key for you know finding uses for hard to recycle materials, and that's that's really critical. There's you know materials have a reason. Sometimes there's barrier requirements for products and packages that need to be met to provide a safe and uh, quality product to consumers. And that's where I think someone like a company like TerraCycle is really helpful. Um, and then of course, looking at um, a lot of materials when it comes to making them recyclable, and there's been a lot of advances there as well. Yeah, I'll just echo that Hershey is also in the infant stages of a program with Loop as well. Um, looking, it's our first venture of trying to uh, do the reuse program for our consumers. And on the materials side of that as well, um, you know, there's a, a big trend, especially when it comes to flexible packaging, uh, moving to um, monostructures. Um, that is a very well-known um, fact in the industry right now that moving away from multi-structured uh, flexible films and trying to move into a more uh, polyethylene specific uh, material that is recycled at uh, store drop off and the how and one of the programs that's helping us do that is the how to recycle program which is a labeling and uh, has a recycling nomenclature for consumers to kind of understand what to do with the packaging or how to dispose of it I should say yeah. I, I, that's a great point John I think that uh, how to recycle is a key part I think you mentioned in your intro, Angeli, about uh, consumers recycling. I think communicating on how to recycle is really important to um, ensure consumers start doing it. And I think consumers seeing a number versus seeing instructions is, is a big change. That's totally right. Uh, Meltem, is there anything that you, you want to add? Because you had the heart of research uh, in this field. I think uh, from scientific perspective, there are two things that uh, already uh, has mentioned, but I would like to reiterate them. One of them is using uh, plastics or synthesizing plastics that they are biodegradable and biocompostable when we send them to the uh, them to the environment, both natural and engineered environments. They can start to degrade or compost it to their uh, ingredients, so which is good. Uh, when we look at the overall plastic waste accumulation in the world, that is good. And the other thing that uh, using the existing plastic waste as a feedstock to mm -hmm. produce new uh, products, again, is kind of infinite recyclability. I think these are going to be helpful uh, when it comes to the uh, reducing the plastic, current plastic waste. And yeah, I think on my end, it's it's tough for us to weigh in because as TerraCycle, we really don't produce packaging. So I'm going to focus more on the loop side of our business. And, and what we're seeing in, in loop is, I think it's it's not so much a, a technical advantage to begin with, but it's it's a philosophic one. And in loop, it's about returning ownership of packaging back to the manufacturer, right? And, and making packaging an, aspect, uh, an asset. And Hopefully what that's allowing our partners to do is perhaps invest more in their packaging today when that becomes an asset that can be depreciated um, over time. And how does investing into packaging perhaps improve the performance of that packaging, not only from an environmental perspective, um, but also from a technical perspective, right? Can we have um, products in the food space um, be fresher longer? Does it affect shelf life? Does it affect, um, you know, food from, from not becoming waste uh, sooner? So I think it, it's interesting to see a lot of our partners toy with that idea of, of kind of building in technology that's going to protect their product for the consumer longer. Thank you so much. So you've all mentioned uh, recyclability uh, upcycling uh, as well. So how are we improving and optimizing that like recyclability through packaging? What have you seen? 
to Jamie? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, I mentioned the loop, and I think that's the biggest, the one thing we're working on now that, that we're really excited about here at Ocean Spray, and it's something that's new and, and well, actually, it's not new. We, we, we Turnbull containers exist, but something in the States, not as much now. So I think um, we're really excited about being partnered with Loop on this. And I think that right there allows us to, you know, the reuse is a big piece for us. Yeah, I'll just reiterate, we're trying to come up with an, uh, new, uh, new ideas and new packaging that can really engage the consumer to reuse the packaging, if maybe not just specifically um, like in a, a return uh, program, but maybe reuse the packaging at home. Um, so trying to, any type of like bulk container or um, things that have like the sharing aspect inside your home, we're trying to create those types of experiences um, with new innovation with our packaging. Super interesting, thank you. Um, so now for uh, Jamie, John and Tony, what are the main internal and external challenges that you're facing in your companies? Um, from from our, our perspective, um, we, Ocean Spray has clean labels, which is a great thing. Um, however, with that, you have to thermally process our beverages. And I think just finding the right technology unlock that's going to allow for you know new or different materials to be used in a um, thermally processed environment is a challenge um, but luckily we are we have some really great engineers here that are working on this and we're also partnered as you know with plug and play to find um, different technologies out there that can help with that so that's that's i say is one of the challenges yeah very similarly um, a lot of our pack main packaging is flexible films i would say about um, I think around 90 or 85 to 90% of our main packaging is flexible film. And the, the challenge lay in there is that a lot of it is multi-structured and moving forward, uh, looking at these monostructures that, which is, seems to be the trend that's going right now. And uh, a lot of the, the non-barrier solutions that we have right now are gonna be easy changes over to this monostructure, but there are products that need um, any types of barriers or float for protection from aroma or, or flavor. Um, those types are also challenges, being that uh, we haven't been able to identify any type of sustainable solutions for those. Um, and the, that same point, a lot of our packaging that has metallized um, material, which is not currently re re recycled in the recycling stream as is in the US, um, finding alternative materials for those has been a challenge. Um, so looking at in the future at solutions such as uh, biodegradability and compostable solutions is an option that um, we're trying to look at moving forward. Great. And I think from, from our perspective, again, I'm going to break it down between TerraCycle and Loop because they're, they're two very different challenges, but one that are closely aligned. I think on the TerraCycle side, the biggest challenge we have is, is recycling is, is, is not in the best place right now. You know, I think the EPA last week came out and, and showed that recycling from 2017 to 2018 was down almost a percent and a half. And I think when, when we look at the effect that COVID had or has on, on recycling today, it's going to drop even further. Um, and it's, so that's, that's a challenging place right now. And for TerraCycle, what we're trying to do and the challenge we have is how do we fill that gap, right? Where less material is being recycled, how can, can we step up and recycle more? And how can we do it in a way that, that is cost-effective to our partners? Because our goal is to, to continually scale up our programs, uh, but it needs to be done in a way that, that the business case is there as well. So that's, Const, it's the constant dichotomy that we have internally is, is how do we continue to grow um, and how do we make this a, an affordable option to our partners so that consumers have an easy way to recycle those materials. Um, I don't think TerraCycle is a silver bullet and we're not going to solve the world's recycling problems. Mm -hmm. um, so as John mentioned earlier, um, you know, the how to uh, recycle labeling, looking at more monomers, that's going to be so important in the future. Um, but that's where we are in TerraCycle today. On the Loop side, I think Loop is exciting because we're 
we're tackling, tackling the problem at its core. How do we avoid things from becoming waste in the first place? I think is how we win long-term, right? Because recycling is can be sometimes a band-aid on a cut. Uh, but while exciting, it is still very new. Um, we are asking our companies like, like Ocean Spray and Hershey's who've been around for a hundred plus years to completely change the way they do everything. And that's not, that's not an easy thing to do. So right now we're still small in scale. We're growing, but it's not going to have the immediate impact that we needed to have in terms of volume. And what we are working on, and, and if I look at what 2021 and beyond will bring to Loop, is the advent of the retailer playing a much bigger role, right? So here in the United States, we have Kroger, we have Walgreens. Um, mm -hmm. You would have seen announcements with, with Burger King. Um, all of these players are, are going to have a huge role in bringing Loop to scale because we want them to do what they do best. And that is take these unique products our, brands, our brand partners are producing and get them in the hands of consumers. So I think that's that's the number one challenge we have today uh, on the loop side is, is how do we bring this to more people and how do we start to take advantage of economies of scale? Thank you so much. It's really, really interesting and uh, great to see um, all the things that you're working on are very energizing. Uh, Maltem, you and your team must have been working on some very exciting technology in the packaging space at the Argonne National Laboratory. So we'd love to learn more about, uh, about it. Thank you. Uh, due to plastic accumulation, Department of Energy started Plastic Innovation Challenge last year, so which uh, provided uh, funding opportunities for scientists at national laboratories uh, as well as academia and the industry. With those fundings, we will be able to start new initiatives at Argan as well. Uh, at Argan, we have a circular uh, economy initiative. This is an emerging initiative in our uh, R&D. And our aim is to develop responsible innovation framework uh, for considering the end of life of uh, plastics, including uh, packaging, uh, used for uh, food and beverage industry. And also we are looking for the life cycle analysis uh, through the entire supply chain, starting from the raw feedstocks to the end of users or gravel, we say that. And to achieve those sustainability with the new uh, uh, technologies, we are really looking for two things. Uh, can we use existing plastic waste as a feedstock to develop new uh, polymers that can be used in formulation of food uh, and beverage uh, packaging materials? Or can we use uh, bio materials, bio mass uh, based materials uh, in formulation of those uh, recipes as well? Uh, again, with the end of life, uh, uh, characteristics uh, within in our mind. So recently we received six different uh, funding uh, funding uh, from Department of Energy for development of new tools that is going to help also industry when it comes to the designing new materials uh, to achieve their sustainability goals as well as to develop eco-friendly products and also we are working on development of new technologies, uh, including uh, food and uh, packaging industry as well. Great. It was great to hear your perspective from a more academic perspective. Um, and so one of the reasons we're launching a new office in Chicago, often called the Silicon Valley of food production, is because it's a very dynamic and very innovative region, especially for food manufacturing. So Melton, because you're based in the region, so uh, what are the main R&D initiatives that have been emerging in the packaging space in Chicago over the past few years that are very intriguing and interesting to you? Or like any other, uh, any collaborations that you've been working on in, in the Chicago area or? Yes. Uh, for one of my funded projects, I'm going to work with the Mars mm -hmm. uh, R&D uh, chemist uh, because 
uh, when you are working in the area, you have to make sure that your products is going to well align with industry needs. Mm -hmm. So we will work with them when we scale up our technology. So they are going to test it, the performance of newly uh, synthesized, newly produced uh, packaging materials for application of for their uh, uh, products as well. So we have been very working, uh, closely working with the Mars for awesome. that new technology development. Awesome, really interesting, thank you. Um, how, another question, so how does the fact that legislation keep evolving and especially differ from one country to another impact your packaging sourcing? Like as is, how is it a main constraint for you and what are the solutions that you, you're finding to overcome this? Um, from from Osha's spray perspective, um, you know, I think the, the key thing is is really just staying on top of what the regulations are. So you know they're much different here and, and than they would be in Europe. And it's really important just to partner with our vendor partners and the right team to understand where the regulations are changing and uh, you know just being nimble to react to that. Yeah, just to re reiterate what uh, Jamie was saying that, uh, you know, Hershey is a global company and we need to make sure that we're, you know, stay in contact with our, our, our team in different parts of the, of the, of the world, meaning that um, they may or may not have different recyclable um, initiatives and different types of materials that are recyclable in their country that may not be in the U.S. Um, and so just making sure that um, we're sharing information back and forth, and if we find any new technologies that they can they can use, that they can leverage us, and that's the same way same way we can leverage them as well. Yeah, and yeah, to add to that again, I think communication is really critical. So as long as the you know our, we're global as well, so as long as we are, we're communicating, um, the groups are communicating back and forth. That's really important. I think from from our perspective at TerraCycle, we've been you know, we see this a lot in, in our European markets where uh, EPR has been prevalent for, for many years. Um, for us, we we are a private company, so we, we don't tap into typical municipal schemes that would be affected by legislation. So we're always here to provide a solution for products and packaging that wouldn't be recovered and recycled in, in municipal schemes. So where we've seen EPR and legislation affect us is um, it, we haven't seen legislation push recycling companies to collect and recycle products that wouldn't be recyclable. That's, that's a common um, kind of fallacy that we see that, oh, now EPR is coming, it's gonna make everything recyclable. When in fact, that funding goes towards um, increasing recycling rates for, for existing recyclable packaging, your PETs, your HDPEs that would be recovered. What we've seen in, in working with our, our partners in Europe and state agencies is that um, our partners for running their own recycling programs have been able to get credits uh, mm -hmm. against their, their EPR um, bills. And that's something that we work on um, you know, CTO in France and the Gruner Punkt in Germany and others. Um, and then when it comes to loop, what we've seen is that loop packaging, because not single use, has been exempt from, from any EPR legislation. So that's been uh, a really interesting um, legislative uh, work that, that we've done with our partners in, in Europe and, and where legislation um, is 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 there in those countries very interesting thank you um and meltem uh, out of curiosity does it impact you you work as a researcher as well like the fact that legislations are evolving and um, um yes i mean because of all these uh, stringent criteria help us to develop new technologies find the new tools to, first of all to access the current conditions and also it helps us what will be the solutions based upon this assessment? Yes, I think uh, those new stringent criteria, especially also sustainability goals of many companies, helping us to think differently out of the box. Uh, 
plastics have been integral part of our life last 50 years. We made them for different applications, but right now it is time to rethink about how we can make them much more sustainable, much more eco-friendly. Thank you. What can I say one thing I wanted to add here was, you know, it's not only a global problem. This is also a, a problem within the U.S. being that different municipalities have different legislature, what can and can't be recycled. Um, some cities have store or excuse me, some cities have uh, curbside recycling. Others have uh, drop off at the recycling center. So it is an issue that we still have here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not a single source type of solution. Um, it's kind of a case by case. You need to know who you're what your local community is doing so that we can properly understand how to um, kind of aid those types of uh, solutions. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really uh, crazy to see how fragmented um, the legislations are, not only at a global perspective, but also like within each country. Um, so definitely something that hopefully we're going to uh, solve. Um, so now let's talk about another important topic, smart packaging. So um, packaging, as you all know, can also have a very strong impact to reduce food waste and also, as we've seen during COVID-19, increase food safety. So during the pandemic, food safety and shelf life of perishable food products have been a major concern for all big players in this industry. So for instance, our plug and play teams in China supporting Walmart and sourcing startups within food safety and traceability. So where do you think the legislation for re regulating food packaging will be like in the new normal world post pandemic? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball for this one. I, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to predict. I already, I already mentioned how challenging it is to, to stay on top of the regulations and they're always changing. So I think that's really what it comes down to is 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 understanding, you know, where the, where the industry is going, what regulations or legislations are being passed in the states or across the globe, and being nimble enough to be able to react to those. And that's I think where you know Ocean Spray we're a very nimble company, and I think partnering with um, plug and play and and partners like those are really important to um, be able to nimbly react to these types of changes. So as it's already impacting your, your current sourcing efforts, like the fact that we've seen changes with uh, COVID-19 or um, are you already preparing for, for it? Um, I, I think, you know, we're, we have strong vendor partners here and I think we're just, we're, we're just keeping our eyes open for what's changing moving forward. That's what we're doing right now. I, I you know personally, um, we hadn't seen anything yet that I would, Bring to this discussion, but I again, we're we're staying on top of these things. And John, maybe um, you want to add to it? Like yeah, I mean, as long as uh, to to Jamie's point, you know, you have to make sure that you're up to date and up to speed with what's going on in the industry, um, and keeping those conversations with your vendors, making sure that specifically with this time of COVID making sure that you know, they're not falling behind um, production so that uh, may or may not affect us with our uh, scheduling. So just making sure that those conversations are being held just so that you understand if there's any timing changes or uh, pushing out scheduling that you know, you're, you're on top of that. I think yeah. for us at Loop, it's, it, it hasn't really changed our approach when it comes to, to cleanability of reusable packaging. Uh, we've always uh, worked with our partners to ensure that our cleaning standards are going to meet the very stringent QA, QC standards that they have um, to, to use packaging. Again, so we we haven't seen a, a change mm -hmm. at all. And it's it's actually reinforced our, our original position when it comes to, to cleanliness and how we clean. I would say that, that we do we do look at materials and, and make sure that they can withstand the cleaning process. So a really good example is when we're looking at, at alloys today, um, stainless steel is, is an alloy that's performed very well in loop and sometimes aluminum um, doesn't perform as well because naturally it, it does have um, almost like a honeycomb kind of texture and we see 
it's susceptible, more susceptible to microbial buildup. So we, we in loop, we really look at um, what that material is and how does it lend itself to our cleaning infrastructure to make sure that, that we can clean to the, the standards that our partners put on, put on loop. Very interesting. And in general, so even out of COVID-19, so how challenging is it to consider both sustainability, recyclability, while also preserving food quality and preventing any food safety issue? Um, well, here at Ocean Spray, you know, we're, com we're committed to, re you know, responsible practices across our business, which includes, um, you know, being in recyclable, reusable or compostable packaging in the future. And as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, I, I, I think one of the biggest challenges for us is, again, happy to say we have clean labels, need to thermally process the products to provide a, a high quality and safe products for our consumers. And that's where the challenge comes in. You know, when you're thermal, thermally processing um, products, mm -hmm. you know, the package plays a big role in that. And when you're looking at new materials, we need to maintain that quality and safety moving forward. And that, that can be a challenge sometimes. Yeah, so at Hershey, you know, number one priority in looking at uh, any type of new material or, or technology is food safety and quality. So uh, be that performing shelf life studies on these new materials, um, just to make sure that they're staying up to par with our current quality standards. Just making sure that any type of new material we're bringing in house that we really um, test it and validate that it is meeting the same current specifications that we currently are holding. Thank you so much. Um, and Meltem, so can you give us some technology examples of smart packaging that are going to uh, reduce food waste that you've seen emerging? Um, I think one of the things that I am seeing that uh, we we over design most of the materials beyond their service lifetime. So I think the most important thing that there should be an optimization between the uh, service that is we are expecting from packaging versus the uh, life of the uh, packaging material in, in the receiving environments. So this is very important. Another thing that I would like to mention that this is really important that uh, watermark labeling of all these uh, packaging materials, uh, that would be great when it comes to the picking up the uh, uh, right materials that is gonna be used for upcycling purposes later. So I think watermark labeling is another smart technology that I am seeing. It is just started picking up in the US when it comes to the separation and uh, concentration of those uh, food packages in the materials uh, recovery uh, facilities. So I'm seeing that this is a really neat technology when it comes to the reducing the food packaging waste uh, materials. So, and the other things that I am seeing that there is a trend uh, that uh, many uh, industry start to think about uh, instead of multi-layer packaging, they are started to think about monolayer packaging. So these are the two things that I am seeing that is going to be a trend within a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, so now that we all have a better understanding of all the solution, solutions that exist, that you're seeing, all the challenges that you're facing as well, it would be great to learn a bit more about the strategies that your institutions are following to reach uh, these goals. So uh, we've mentioned the partnerships with TerraCycle. Um, it's great to see that two of our, our plug and play partners uh, here today have partnerships with, uh, with TerraCycle. So Tony, can you tell us a bit more about uh, your partnership with Hershey and also with Ocean Spray? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but. <laughs> Jamie and John, feel free to, to weigh in. Uh, I think what's interesting in both is that at Loop and at TerraCycle, we're here to provide a solution where, where one doesn't exist. 
right? So when it comes to Hershey's, I believe we're starting with um, with one of one of the brands making a specific product, um, and and we'll be focused on the Canadian marketplace um, to begin with. Yeah. And I think what's wonderful is that, like I said earlier, sometimes the hardest thing to do in in sustainability in packaging is to start. Right. So I think it's it's wonderful that that we're starting to work together and we're going to learn. Right. There are going to be things that work very well. There will be things that we didn't anticipate. Um, and what I've seen is that it, the hardest thing to do is start. So I, I'm really bullish that we're going to to come out with something that's going to be different in this space, that's going to, to perform well and um, you know, I, I hope that there are enough learnings there and there's enough value, um, both from a business and sustainable perspective that we can start to look at, at Hershey's broader portfolio and start to look at the rest of the world. I think, you know, from, but you need to start somewhere, right? So I, I think it's, it's an amazing, um, amazing start. And the product that we're looking at has not been done in loop yet. So I, I love, I love when it's a first. I think that's really cool. And then when it comes to ocean spray, I think it's it's very similar. You know, sometimes, uh, and Jamie, you know, please please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, there's there's a surprisingly wide portfolio of different products uh, when it came to Loop on on where do we start and do we tailor this to a certain type of consumer or do we tailor it to to maybe some of our best performing products, or do we look at a sustainable skew over maybe a more mass market skew? So there are so many decisions that can be made from a business perspective, but um, I, I love the fact that the packaging, hopefully over time, can be universally shared amongst several of the products within the ocean spray portfolio. And then on, on the TerraCycle side, you know, we're, we're here to provide a solution where one doesn't exist. Um, so I, I think the goal there is to provide ocean spray consumers with the option to send back their packaging to be recycled. So again, um, it, it is about starting, it is about learning, but ultimately it's about scaling and making this program um, bigger for ocean spray consumers. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a really fun project to work on, and for for CPGs, it's a different way of working than you know, when you're normally manufacturing something and sending it out and that's that. Now we have to really learn how to balance the return piece and, and you know, Loop's got a, a great system on how to um, properly clean and sanitize the, the package before it gets back to Ocean Spray. And, but it's really fun because it's, it's, to us, it's really new. I know, again, returnable packaging has been out there, but from, from our perspective here and probably a lot of CPGs is not a common. So it's just, it makes it a lot fun. A, a lot more fun to work on and it's just going to be exciting to see the results and the packaging is going to be beautiful and uh, are you can you tell us more about uh, the different partnerships or other initiatives that you're working on um, regarding packaging sustainability anything that you've been part of over the past years sure well i think one is of course is how to recycle which i i, I mentioned earlier it's really important um, again to communicate to consumers on how to um, or where to recycle the packaging, or if it's not recyclable, that case. Um, and, you know, we partnered, I mentioned a little bit earlier as well, we've partnered with Plug and Play to help us solve some of our challenges. Um, we, when we're developing packaging here at Ocean Spray, sustainability and its impact on the environment is one of the key drivers to make a packaging decision for a new product launch or even our current packages. So I think it's just um, partnering with um, with plug and play to see some technologies that maybe we're not aware of through our current vendor partners has is, is been really eye opening. Yeah, I definitely want to reiterate that using plug and play, uh, really utilizing um, the platform to kind of identify the new technologies and of sustainable materials and really to kind of help us find solutions for our more longer term initiatives. Um, you know, we don't really have the best visibility to what else is out there. So pulling um, utilizing uh, plug and play to really find those solutions for us has been very helpful. Yeah, thanks a lot for the kind words. Um, what are the um, some of the sustainability goals uh, within your organization? What is your roadmap for success? 
like do you have any KPIs and um, any plans that you're trying to follow? How is it structured for your companies and institutions in general? Well, for, for us, we're, we're looking to, you know, be recyclable um, or composable or reusable in the future. That's really what we're focusing on. So we want to make sure that our packaging meets those. And so when we're launching new products now, um, we've got um, one crave uh, craveology that's in in uh, recyclable film. So we that was one of our first steps towards that. So we do we again, and then I've, I've already mentioned a couple of times loop as well for the reusable piece. And again, partnering with um, plug and play to look at alternate materials that can be you know properly thermally processed. So yeah, from a Hershey standpoint, really focusing currently on the recycling part of um, the sustainability aspect, and then. You know, moving forward, looking at the reusability um, for our types of uh, packaging using loop programs and, and things like that. And Meltem, how did, does it look like from your perspective? Like, how do you evaluate uh, success and what is your main goal? Sure. Uh, currently, we have life cycle analysis tool named Nigrit. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, 43,000 users worldwide to assess the sustainability of mm -hmm. any uh, product, uh, starting from uh, raw uh, feedstock to the end of the use of that product. So our aim is to update this grid model with the industrial uh, data for uh, plastics industry as well. And another, our goal is develop a new tool. Uh, we name it responsible innovation um, assessment framework that considers end of life uh, end of life of any plastics materials both in engineered environments as well as natural environments to promote the circular economy as well as to help the R&D scientists it doesn't matter that scientist is in academia or in industry to assess their uh, synthesis uh, design how should it be how their uh, new product uh, can be uh, sustainable so our aim is to develop new tools for them another uh, our initiative is that development of new processes and also new polymers uh, at advanced scale and scale up their production to the pilot scale hopefully industry will take it for full scale applications again, uh, to help the industry to reach their sustainability goals. Uh, with that, we have been currently uh, developing two technologies. One of them is using uh, shopping bags, grocery bags mm -hmm. as a feedstock to produce lubricants, uh, to reduce the, you know, their accumulation. And we would like to apply this technology for other uh, packaging, uh, uh, plastics as well. Uh, another program is focusing on using the biomass as a starting feedstock uh, to produce single use plastics as well as um, candy wrappers or other things. Again, uh, end of uh, life uh, characteristics uh, has been taught at the beginning of the uh, initial phase, not the end of the uh, process. Great. Um, and um, Tony, how does it look like for both the recycle and you? Yeah, I think for, for us, our goal is to support our clients, right? Our, our, our clients being, you know, mainly CPG companies and, and retailers. Um, a lot of them have KPIs that they've set, set out as a company to, to achieve. And we, we are a service company, right? So we're here to help um, service those needs. And it can be either through recyclability. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I haven't talked a lot about today is, is also another pillar of our business around using um, recycled content. So we support a lot of our clients there. And then um, when it comes to reusability, it's loop. So I think for us, it's how do we, how do we continue to support our clients to help them achieve their goals? Great. Thank you. Um, so before we going, we're moving to the Q&A uh, part, do you have any final words that you want to share with your audience? Um, what me message would you like to share regarding food safety and food packaging in general? 
I guess I'm not on mute, so I'm happy to go first. Um, for us, I, I think that what we've seen in, in the 20 years we've been in business is, is there's no silver bullet to, to solving this problem. And I think it's going to take a multitude of, of different approaches um, to, to solve the sustainability problem that, that kind of we've created today. So I think it's amazing to see companies um, trial different things. Um, and I think it's probably going to be a combination of all those attempts that's, that's going to start to get us back on the right path. And, and here at Osha Spray, again, to meet our sustainability initiatives, um, A, it's a, it's a big decision on which package to move forward when we're doing new launches or looking at our current uh, packaging base. And, you know, it's exciting to see a lot of new technologies come out and really keep an eye on regulation, uh, legislation when it comes to things like PCR, which is post-consumer recycled content. And, um, you know, that's the type of stuff we're looking at and we're, you know, working on new technologies that can help um, in, improve our, our packaging move forward. Um, and I'd say from a Hershey standpoint, you know, really to be successful with sustainability, you need to understand, you know, our, our consumer's perception when it comes to sustainability. Um, what do they, um, what do they see when it comes to uh, recyclability and how can we answer the, or cater to our consumer um, and then as uh, Jamie, you mentioned, you know, really staying up to date with regulation and understanding those changes and uh, so that we can make them internally so we can output those. And Meltem, is there any words that you would like to, to add? Yeah, I would like to pass on this question. <laughs> So uh, now we're going to move to uh, the Q&A part. We have quite a few questions. So um, do you see any potential in biodegradable packaging? What is your opinion in biodegradation additives for conventional plastics? Uh, again, at Orspray, we're, we're exploring a lot of technologies and that would certainly be one of them. Um, I, and I saw a question pop up before about looking at the, uh, seeing the paper bottle Diageo and Bacardi did. And yeah, we're exploring those types of technologies as well. Yeah, really understanding that biodegradable packaging has to deal with um, a really understanding um, how the packaging is being handled at end of life. Um, so if it's going through the recycling stream, is it going into a landfill or is it going uh, into composting and that industrial composting is in your backyard composting. So really understanding how the end of life is gonna be for that specific package um, is kind of how you have to, to think up front in designing. Uh, biodegradable, the word is kind of loaded because um, it can be um, everything from biodegradable materials. It can be made from uh, plants, uh, it can be made from uh, different types of um, like mineralized layers of, of content. So just kind of having to understand where that end product is gonna be um, and kind of designing it upfront for that. So uh, the next question that we have is when it comes to uh, reusable containers, what are the main concerns you have and how are you planning to overcome those? I guess this is for me. Um, I think for, for Loop, uh, we, we could spend an hour just on this question itself, so I'll try to be succinct. I think when we work with our partners on reusability, we're really looking uh, through two lenses. The first is, is it durable enough, right? So are we going to be able to reuse that package a multitude of different times? And I think one of the things that's very interesting that's come out of our, our year and a half that we've been live so far is that the expectation over time is that these packages will look reused or, or look used, excuse me. Um, and and that's, that's a little bit of a different approach for, for our brand partners. And, and the, the idea of designing into aging is something that, you know, we really don't have to deal with in single use packaging, right? So how do we continue to have a, a package that performs the way it needs to perform, um, that looks the way it needs to look uh, while, while not completely damaging a brand's reputation. Um, and 
while we are here and we're talking about packaging and the science behind it today, there are also, you know, marketers who, who have their own job to do and we have to respect um, the equity of the brand and how that can translate to, to reusability. So that's, that's one side. And then the other side is cleanability, right? Can we clean um, what packaging is, is being developed? And, you know, for us so far, there are different materials that lend themselves very well to cleaning and, and some that are a little bit more challenging. So how do we work with our partners to give them that insight so that they can make educated decisions as it relates to their packaging? Thank you. Another question for you, Tony, uh, from Tetra Pak. In the case of Loop, uh, is the overall impact of the process in the environment actually better than more traditional single-use recyclable packaging? Um, yes. So the simple answer is yes. We've done upwards of two dozen LCAs to date with our partners um, to go through those scenarios to prove that um, reusability is, is better environmentally speaking than single use. And what we compare to is uh, material recyclability is our floor. Right, that's what we're comparing reuse to, and we're comparing uh, or we're, we're marking against eight different categories. We're marking against carbon. We're marking against water usage. We're marking against air pollution and five others that escape me um, right now. But uh, I'll, I'll say this: the World Economic Forum, Greenpeace, the World Wildlife Forum, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation wouldn't be publicly promoting Loop and our partners for the efforts that they're doing in reusability if we weren't able to prove that, yes, it is substantially better, environmentally speaking. Um, so the next question is, um, how do your companies think about balancing the need to innovate packaging with an extra cost of innovating and sustainable packaging? <laughs> I'll start there. So. When it comes to sustainable packaging, I think everyone knows it's, it's going to be an investment. Um, I think that uh, just really understanding up front that, you know, if we're going to make a decision to be a more sustainable company up front, there's going to be uh, money that's going to need to be backing that. Um, and I think that once the technologies are there and they're more, um, more common, that cost will come down. But initially, and there aren't many uh, leaders in the industry currently that are making a lot of recyclable material, so it's very scarce. And so having to uh, pay that premium to use those materials is where the cost is coming in at. In at. Yeah, I, I completely agree, John. I think that's a, a, always a challenge, and it, but a big win is when you can make it work, when you can make a packaging system work for the consumer um, and for the environment at the same time, that's really, really, where where a big win happens. Yeah. I think it's just a challenge of balancing all these things out as you're developing it. And keeping sustainability, again, is a key decision point in which package you're moving forward with. So the next question is going to be for Meltem. So uh, I am Gregory, Technical Executive of Multiprint multi Serigraphy Cameroon. Um, uh, Meltem shows two ways to uh, improve packaging based on waste, based on biopolymers, how do the power parameters of this packaging, strengths, clothes, eight, A's, et cetera, will match the expected specs? Um, currently, uh, as I mentioned here, is not improve the packaging. Our aim is to develop sustainable packaging for the industry. So um, we use two uh, feedstocks. One is, uh, using the currently waste waste uh, plastic as a feedstock. The second one is using the biomass as a feedstock to produce biopolymers. And uh, since uh, product acceptance is going to take time, so what we are plan what we have been working on right now, uh, we are developing new plastics that is going to be kind of serve as a drop in placement of the current plastics that has been used for uh, packaging purposes and um, when we are uh, synthesizing those new materials we have been also conducting performance evaluation tests such as tensile strength water permeability or other things and 
uh, currently we have been uh, conducting those tests by using the uh, the products available in grocery stores like stretch films or other things that have been used for food uh, uh, storage uh, or food packaging purposes. And our aim is what we can learn from the current uh, information. We need to make the same uh, specs, but to reach that point, can we learn from the existing plastics can we inverse their design? So it can help us uh, to meet our sustainability goals, which are either infinite recyclability or they can be uh, compostable and biodegradable when they hit the receiving environments. But uh, we, we are looking for also their benign products. I should also mention that Bioplastics doesn't mean that they are completely biodegradable or biocompostable. Since they are coming from the biomaterials, they may also persist in the receiving environment. So uh, there are, as John mentioned that when we are saying bio, it has many things in it. So uh, by using the biomaterials as a starting material and then following the same recipes that have been used for the production of current materials doesn't mean that end of life is going to be benign. It may not. So I'm really a bit cautious for those terms. Thank you, Melzem. Um, so the next question is biodegradable and compostable solutions have been known to be not very effective in the US because of a lack of compost infrastructure. Why do companies look at those as the next generation solutions? How can we make them actually actual positive impact on the environment versus marketing efforts? Um, from application perspective, I can say that landfills in the United States, <laughs> landfill operations in the United States is getting very expensive. And also, uh, Space availability is going to be a stringent criteria when we send all our municipal solid waste collected from cities or from homes. So uh, in that case, we need to look for other alternatives. Anaerobic digesters, which, has, which have been used uh, in the US for reducing the volume of the uh, organic waste. Mm -hmm. But in 2014, EPA changed it. EPA changed that if any biogas uh, coming from uh, municipal uh, water treatment plants uh, is going to be a, considered as a renewable fuel, I think there is a trend in the US that we will see more anaerobic digesters, we will see more composting facilities to reduce the volume of the plastic waste. So the next question, which is the higher cost the consumer is willing to accept in return of a recyclable packaging? I think I, I can speak to, to Loop here. Um, I think when it comes to Loop in our, our business model, one of the, the first kind of paradigm shifts is, is the idea of ownership, right? Where our manufacturing partners own the packaging that they produce and the consumer puts a deposit to, to secure that packaging um, for the manufacturer. And what's been very interesting to see is that right now our, our average deposit is around $3 um, per package, mm -hmm. but the, the, the products that are actually performing the best in loop and selling the most are actually the containers that have the highest deposit. Um, but with that high deposit comes, you know, packaging that either in, improves the performance of the product or is, is visually appealing, right? So even before COVID, the number two selling product on loop was Clorox disinfecting wipes. And it also represents the highest deposit of, of $10 but it is something that Clorox developed together with Kohler. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually a very counterworthy, beautiful package. So um, we're seeing that 
where the quality is there in packaging, um, customers have been willing to, to accept the idea of a deposit, noting that as soon as they send back that packaging, they will get the value of their deposit back. Thank you, Tony. Um, so the next question, um, to guarantee food conservation, flexible packaging, I usually suggest a packaging to any co customer regarding WVTR, OTR, and HSS. Is there any other major spec I should really check? Uh, I guess there, uh, sorry, John, go ahead. I was gonna say, it really depends on your product. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it depends on what type of material you need based off of the water vapor transfer rate, if it's oxygen, moisture, uh, flavor, how sensitive it is to light. So it, it really needs, it, it's dependent on what your product is. Um, I think you have a good base there for looking for, um, you know, those types of specs. Um, so starting there is a good point, but if you need to get more specific on uh, what type of product you're using, um, you may need to look a bit further. Yeah, exactly. I think um, those are a great place to start. I think you need to look at your uh, product mode of failure and understand, you know, that is the first piece. Understand what your product needs and then develop your packaging around that. So our next question is from Ocean Spray. Uh, what are things that manufacturers, suppliers, and retailers can do to bring consumers in as part of solutions on reduce, reuse, recycle, and pay for the cost of convenience, landfill, cleaning up pollutions? Sorry, can you repeat that one? I was trying to read along and I missed it. Sure. Sorry about that. So what are, what are things that manufacturers suppliers and retailers can do to bring consumers in as part of solutions on reduce, reuse, recycle, and pay for the cost of convenience, landfill, cleaning, cleaning up pollutions? Um, I think it's something that John may have touched on earlier, just, uh, you know, helping, you know, providing the packaging that's, that's, that's easier for them to, to manage and recycle and communicating where it goes. And also, again, with Loop, you know, we're, we're providing that's where the consumer does have interplay between ocean spray and, and um, loop and the package itself where they have to actually return it. Um, so it's a little bit different behavior. So I, I think it's the type of things that will continue to evolve over time. Um, but again, I think us helping the consumer first um, is where we're, we're heading right now. So uh, next question from uh, Tetra Pak. Focusing so much into waste management and end of life of packaging, don't we risk to lose attention to the rest of the value chain of the food packaging? Example, sources, transportation, efficiency, consumption, overall performance, et cetera. Yeah, I'll say at Hershey, um, we definitely are focused on sustainably sourcing our materials that when we can. For example, our paperboard and uh, corrugate um, materials are sustainably sourced. Um, when it comes to our flexibles, that's a different story. Obviously, we're working on that um, currently. Uh, but yes, I, we are focusing on sourcing um, our materials sustainably as, we, as much as possible. Um, but yes, I do understand that there's a lot of focus on the end of life, um, whereas you know some of the behind the scenes things that companies are doing aren't as talked about because it's not as forefront in the consumer's eyes. Thank you. So next question, what do we do about food delivery with hundreds of millions of people ordering food every day? Government mandated compostable containers, is there any way to incorporate with reusable containers into the system at that scale? I'll, I'll speak for, for Loop and I can say that um, it's definitely becoming a concern and within Loop, we have created um, reusable packaging that we deliver all of our products in when it comes to our retail channels. Um, but we're also working with online retailers um, who have expressed a lot of interest in Loop, not only for the products that they sell, but also for their shipping materials. And we're also having conversations with a lot of food um, delivery companies as well to help them uh, with their, their shipping um, packaging waste that they currently have today. Thank you. Um, 
What happened with the prohibition about the packaging and the new European legislatives about that? How can we make that materials uh, be in a circular economy? Oh, sorry, Hassan. Not sure I have an answer for that. Again, I, I, I'll just kind of harken back to what I spoke to earlier. I think, again, what we've seen with, with EPR and legislation is that it doesn't always mean that what is being produced will be recovered, right? Usually it goes towards materials that are already municipally recyclable. So I don't think that government legislation is um, is a silver bullet to, to the answer for waste. Um, and, and I think that again, it's, it's a working with the manufacturers and in taking a lot of different approaches to, to kind of waste. Um, so that's, that's just what I've seen um, in, in my history. And again, working with, with CTO, working with the Gruner Punkt, um, I, I think it's incredibly important, but it's not, it's not the solution. So next question, plastic generated from used agricultural pesticide containers is becoming a big issue in many parts of the world. Are there plastic alternatives that can easily replace HDPE for pesticide use that might be more sustainable? I don't work in pesticides, so I can't I can't answer that question. But I I'll put a plug for plug and play here. That you know if you you know there's a lot of companies that plug and play has partnered with. They may be able to help you if you work directly with them. Yeah. Um. How how do you? I'm sorry. Um. What do you think is the best recycled material for fresh meat conservation? Again, I don't have an answer for that. That's not really the, yeah, <laughs> the same area. area of expertise. I, I, I got to, I'm with John here on that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Same. So next question for Tony, what is the business model behind Loop? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a loaded question, but I'll, I'll try to, to say it uh, very simply. I think for, for us, Loop, Loop is a platform. Right, and there are a few key stakeholders within the platform. The first are, are the brands and the manufacturers of products, right? We want Ocean Spray, we want Hershey to continue doing what you guys do best, and that's create products that people love. The only difference is we, we would love for you to fill them in, in reusable packaging. The, the next key stakeholder is the retailer, right? Loop, Loop is playing the role of retailer today, but that's not how we're going to scale and grow. Um, we want Carrefour and Tesco and Kroger and Walgreens to do what they do best. And that's get these unique products that the brands are creating in the hands of consumers. And I think whether that's online, whether that's in store, um, it, it, we're seeing that it's gonna be a combination of both. And then that leaves loop, right? And at the end of the day, what we are is, is really the cleaner and sanitizer of these packages as they come back empty from the consumer so that we can send them back to the brands to be reused and refilled. And then the, the second piece long-term is this idea of the platform, right? We want Loop to be as easy as disposability at some point. And what we envision is you may buy, you know, your Ocean Spray and Hershey at Kroger, but you may live down the street from a Burger King. That's a loop partner and you could drop your products off there. You know, could we work with municipalities to install um, reuse collection bins within the cities that we're operating? Could you buy something at Kroger and return it at Walgreens and vice versa? So this idea of the platform and, and making reusability easy to access from the consumer is the, the ultimate goal. And with that, we want to bring scalability and more people participating so that when we work with our partners, again, like a Hershey or an Ocean Spray, it's not just a singular platform at one retailer. 
for them, it's it's going to behave like they behave today. They're creating products and they're selling it to a lot of different retailers and other sales channels. So I think long term, that's where we want to be and where we want to go. So thank you so much, everyone. I think we're getting to the end of the discussion. Uh, I wanted to thank um, all the panelists today and also all the attendees. Thank you for the great questions and for for your insights to the panelists it was. Uh, really great to learn more about what's happening in terms of future of packaging innovations. It's really fascinating and uh, a lot of people want to learn more about it. Um, so uh, regarding plug and play, we would love you to keep joining our events. We're going to organize more uh, in the next coming months. If you have any questions, need any information, want to uh, get in touch with our panelists as well, feel free to reach out to us to food at pnptc.com. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, again. <laughs>